Welcome to the At The Cold Face podcast with your host, Jason Greenwood. This podcast is all about what it's really like in the trenches of digital and e-commerce. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the pod. I have an absolute banger for you guys today. I It is my distinct pleasure to welcome Jake Disraeli from Treat to the podcast today. Welcome, Jake. Jason, so great to be here. Thanks so much. Man, I have not been able to escape you in the uh, the digital press, the e-commerce press over the last few months. It has been nonstop talk about Treat. One of the first articles that I saw about you guys was in mid-October, you guys announced the partnership that you did with Shein. Your technology was being used by the Shein Exchange for their resale marketplace functionality. And then as luck would have it, we talked about this before we went live, as luck would have it, you guys have literally just announced today your your capital raise, three point your or your additional capital raise of three point five million dollars. So you guys are a hot property raise. Been a busy couple of months, but honestly, it's just it's just been a busy couple of years since we got started. We launched the business in January twenty twenty one and launched with our first brands about four months after that, and it's, we've just been hitting the gas pedal nonstop since then. And I think we've been really fortunate to get, yeah, like you said, a lot of press recently. The benefit about working in a company like Treat is we get to launch with really great, exciting brands. And that can also help make headlines, which also helps me spread the word on Treat, which is obviously how you came across us. Love it. And that this latest funding round brings your total funding to $6.4 million. So nothing to sneeze at there. So clearly, the VC space, the market, seeing huge promise and potential with the Treat Powerhouse. Yeah, absolutely. So we raised our first round of funding a little over a year ago. And at that time, it was just my myself and my co-founder, Sonia Yang, who's our amazing CTO. And we had basically built an MVP product, launched with a few brands and had a vision for what we thought branded resale would become in about a year. And our thought there was it's too good of an opportunity for brands to pass up, especially at, the time, at a time when brands are faced with so much pressure to be more sustainable and at a time where there's like rising ad costs, new customer acquisition is everything, but there's no like magic formula for finding customers at a affordable price anymore. And so we thought that brand resale was going to check off a lot of boxes. And I think we were really right place at right time, to be honest. So grateful for that. People talk about luck being a percentage of it. I think luck had a lot to do with it. We had a good idea and it was right time for the market to take place. And we quickly grew after that from a few brands to now we power about 65, a little over 65 brands today in about a year. And if we think about your technology, and we'll get into that in a little bit more detail, but maybe before we jump straight into the tech and how you guys do what you do and what you do, maybe we could talk about a little bit about your background because you've got a really blended background. You do have a bit of a tech background, you were, but you also have that commercial background. You've been director of sales at Indiegogo. You were a senior sales associate at Launchpad Central, but you were also co-founder of the Cardboard Guys. So you've got entrepreneurial experience. You've got business experience. You've got some tech experience mixed in there. You've got a very eclectic background. So maybe before we jump straight into what Treat is and what you guys do and how you do it, Maybe you could tell me a little bit about how you even came up with the idea of Treat in terms of what led you, what was the pathway based on your background to arrive at the Treat scenario? Yeah, sure. Great question. I think on paper, on LinkedIn profiles, it's, it can, my, my background seems a little bit unclear and it was a wave of a lot of different things. But if you go back to what I did in college, it makes a lot more sense. So I studied entrepreneurship and environmental studies in school and then From there, I've had an obsession with startups and entrepreneurship. So my first job out of college was actually to run the innovation programs at the university level and at the college level, which then led me into joining one of those companies, helping co-found what we called the Cardboard Guys, a D2C furniture company where we sold cardboard furniture to kids. And uh, and then after that, had a hunger for to join sales world in the tech world, move up to San Francisco. And I've been in in SF ever since for about the past like eight or nine years. And, and have still maintained my interest in startups. And so eventually joined Indiegogo to help lead their sales efforts, helping brands launch on a platform to help them raise money through pre-orders, not so dissimilar to what we're doing today, which is helping 
brands launch on a resale platform to help them raise money through resale orders. And then along the way, I've started a few other D2C companies, mostly as like side businesses or side hustles. And so I started to really form my deep interest and passion with startups and then with D2C in the Shopify space and have kept my love for the environment all the way since college and the outdoors. And so when I left, uh, when I left Indiegogo, I actually originally was going to launch my own menswear line that was going to incorporate circularity from the beginning, like a resale and a take back model was going through the process of building that company is going to be called a, again, apparel company. And through several months of building that, talking to manufacturers, building out the marketing materials for that launch, really stumbled across a much bigger opportunity, which was instead of being the brand and the tech platform and trying to do both at the same time, could we just do the platform and help any brand do what we were trying to do? And that was the really big unlock to be like, okay, number one, we can create a much bigger company this way, really a more VC backable company that can grow rather quickly. And number two, we think we can actually make a much bigger impact from an environmental standpoint by creating the tools to enable any brand to do what we were setting out to accomplish. So that was like the original kind of spark and kind of journey, if you will, that led us to founding Tree. And look, you're in good company. Obviously, there's companies like I, until I started seeing you guys explode onto the scene through all the positive press that you have been getting over the last few months. I had heard of ThreadUp. Obviously, I'm very familiar with Miracle. I'm very familiar with Marketplacer. These are other marketplace technology platforms. ThreadUp in particular, I'm guessing, is probably your most direct competitor in the market. I'm, I guess I'm familiar with this this platform as a service play. And that's yeah. really what you guys are. You're providing a complete end-to-end -end turnkey marketplace platform, particularly aimed at the vertical of fashion retail, right? And so allowing brands to, to be more circular in their thinking, which the particularly the fast fashion vertical has come under massive fire over the last few years because of its environmental impact the waste issue, the throwaway at the end of season issue. There's just so many issues from inks to where the yeah. products are made. And there's just so much to it, right? It's a very complex industry. And I don't want to get into the politics of it because we could spend hours talking about that. But really what, you, what it feels like your platform enables brands to do is to deal with one of perhaps the most challenging aspects of the industry, which is, okay, when I get tired of a piece of clothing, what do I do with it? Do I throw it away? Do I give it away? Do I put it in a clothing bin for the Sally's? What do I do with this piece of clothing? And how can I, as a brand owner, help facilitate that so that less product end, uh, ends up in la landfill? It makes it yeah. all the way to the end of its useful life, et cetera. And it feels like you fit fairly and squarely in that gap. Yeah, it, exactly. And I think it's important to to say that Treat doesn't solve every problem, but you mentioned a lot of problems in the fashion space and maybe someday we'll be able to start to tackle some of those too. But we call Treat and we, we, the business that we're in is in the extension of life business right now. And so there's the end of life business, which we're starting to partner with more recyclers and folks that can actually you know tear down items and find the right uses for them once they're end of life. But it's this whole bridge to get to end of life that we play. So we want to make sure that every single item that can be resold is resold, ideally through treat, but really just through anywhere and lives its longest life possible. We know that, that there was a, a report that the Business of Fashion put out um, last year, which basically found that only 5 to 8% of resellable clothes are being resold today. And so our goal is to make sure that we can drastically increase the number of resellable clothes that are just sitting in people's closets that can be resold. We want to make sure that they are. And so that, that's really what we're in the business of. And going through brands is a no-brainer. Brands have a ton of data on who has their items, who has items that might be ready to resell. And we're starting to gather even more data brand by brand specifically on um, at one point in time in that item's journey, does it make sense for that customer to sell that item? What is the time period for a pair of jeans versus a pair of shirt, shoes and a pair of sh and a shirt? And make sure that when it's time to resell that item, when it's kind of lived its longest life with that individual, that the seller knows that there's a very easy path to resell it for cash or credit back to the brand and make sure that they don't just throw it away. And so it's about being top of mind for those customers too, to make sure that we can give it its longest life to another, another user. And I guess it incentivizes not only the brand side, but it incentivizes the consumer to do this because... From a brand side, it makes a fantastic brand story. Shein has been under fire 
for its fast fashion approach. It's been under fire a lot, but then it started to get a lot of positive, a, po- a lot of more positive press once they partnered with you. Now, whether Shein is, as I understand it, their product quality is maybe not, it's not top of the pile. It is fast fashion. It's not designed to be worn a thousand times and washed a thousand times necessarily. So the question I guess still remains is will people be able to get the life out of the product to, to make it viable as a resale product? And I guess that that remains to be seen. But more yeah. importantly, I guess them as a brand, they now are seen as actually caring about what happens with their products and trying to make efforts to extend the lifespan of their products in the market. And I'm guessing you you quoted that really interesting data from the business of fashion. So do we have any idea of what's happening to those items today that not, at additional 90, 92% of products that could be resold but aren't? Are they just languishing in wardrobes until people get sick of them and then are they mostly being thrown away is that's what is that what is typically yeah. happening today yeah the most typical path is that right it's it's customers throwing away throwing items away i wish i had the exact stat in front of me right now to share with you but there's it's something like 70 pounds on average per person in the United States per year of clothes that they're throwing away it's something extremely shocking and i guess i hesitate saying a stat that i can't back up but it, Just picture like a very big number. It's pretty incredible. The other places where items end up are places like Goodwill, but only a very small percentage of items that end up at Goodwill are actually able to be resold. They end up going through other channels that that lead to being sold in bulk by the pound into oftentimes uh, other regions around the world and developing countries where they're trying to start their own apparel economies, but they're being inundated with thousands of tons of, of just other people's clothes from the US. And so there really isn't a great solution other than just making sure it's resold and we maintain that value. When it comes to Shein, they are making strides to become more sustainable. And I really emphasize the word more sustainable with all of this stuff. Just because you do a resale program doesn't make you a sustainable brand. It's a lot of things that a brand has to invest in to become sustainable. And even that is like the holy grail that I'm not sure a brand can ever be fully sustainable, but they're trying and machines investing something like $150 million in sustainability and circularity initiatives in the next five years, resale being one of those things and, and other things just based on product research and using better materials and, and looking into recycling efforts and things like that. I think I, to me, it feels like the more treats of this world that jump into the market the better off the whole market will be because presumably you have a specialization and maybe I'll get you to talk a little bit about that in a moment. But really, it feels this is such a large problem. It is a global problem and treat on its own can't solve all of these issues. But the more treats that we have jumping into the market, attacking different facets, different angles, looking at the market through different lenses, this is going to be a long-term effort by an absolute mountain of people to face these challenges. And so it feels you guys can be an example to the market that something that is commercially viable, because obviously you have to have a commercially viable business to be able to stay in business, but you are one of a handful of what I'd call sort of new age businesses that have proved proven that you can marry up the concepts of sustainability and commercial viability at the same time and enhance brand value of your partners all in one hit. Yeah, that that's ex- exactly right. I don't think we would be a business if we weren't able to do both of those things simultaneously. Our, the way that we've been talking about Treat, especially recently, is our mission is to help brands grow responsibly through resale. We want to help brands grow, but there's this, there's this pressure for brands to not only be more sustainable, but there's this idea of degrowth and reducing production and we sympathize with brands because they how are they expected to grow their revenue and and grow their business and hit their numbers if they can't sell more stuff and so that that's where solutions like treat can help and that is the long-term goal is to help brands produce less stuff because they can rely on their secondhand markets to also pick up the slack sounds like a good good part a good a significant play as part of the circular economy now how do you guys differentiate your business model and your technology model, how do you differentiate yourselves from the likes of Miracle or Marketplacer or ThreadUp yeah. or any one of the other sort of players that offer, I've never used your technology, but obviously there's certain components that have to be there 
to establish sure. marketplace and you have to be able to de- deal with the supply side. You have to be able to deal with the demand side, the yeah. listing engine, being able to people for, to upload their products. There, there's a lot to this and, the, and I've worked with marketplace technology before, so it is quite complex to build. It's not simple, but how do you guys differentiate yourself in the market versus other technology platforms that might have certain similarities to what you do? Yeah, we're definitely not first to market for helping brands incorporate resale into their business. Concept has been around for maybe eight plus years before it actually came to to the forefront. What we were seeing was the only brands that were doing it were brands that could afford to do it, like Patagonia, Arcteryx, North Face, Eileen Fisher, and these giant brands that are putting huge budgets behind building these platforms and working with other providers to, to build these programs. But meanwhile, we saw that there were hundreds of thousands of other really like even just specifically apparel brands that could benefit from this model, but wouldn't be able to do a six month implementation and with a huge setup fee and giant minimums on, on, on like annual minimums for resale. Not that's a bad thing for the other guys. I think the fact that the big brands have been doing it for a long time was really inspiring. So it was like, how do we do what they're doing really well for the most amount of people possible? And that comes into play with a few different things. It's how quickly we can get brands set up and activated in an affordable way. It's it's the model of resale. So how can we do it in a really low cost way that has very low operating costs? And then also how can we alleviate all of the, really like the work that they need to do to actually manage the program on a day-to-day. These apparel brands aren't set up to handle like a whole new social media platform essentially like running their own marketplace. They're just not built for that. They're built for creating amazing items and marketing them to their customers the first time around, not necessarily like the mechanics of a marketplace. And so it's those three things that Treat really solves for. Brands can launch a resale experience in under a week. We have very flexible models from peer-to-peer through take-back programs that brands can launch in a very short period of time. Peer-to-peer being our most popular since it's customers selling to and from each other in exchange for cash or credit back to the brand. And there's no operational costs or hurdles associated with that. And then the third piece is we take on all of the customer support. We do all of the disbursements. We handle any misrepresentation claims that come up. And we're generating a lot of the, the marketing efforts too through automation so that it can be very hands-off for brands of any and all sizes to actually launch with. So that's where we see treat in the market. Again, like you said earlier, there's plenty of room for other solutions to differentiate. ThreadUp has an awesome offering as well. They have built up their own operations over the past 10 years to handle a lot of that, a lot of that overhead, but we still haven't seen them launch with brands. I could say, I would say like the Shopify type brands, the SMBs, the mid-market brands, they've still mostly focused on the largest brands in the world. We saw them, I think, launch with Paxson recently, which is great. Made well brands. This is such a it's a joy to my ears because it feels like you are targeting, and you may say, Jason, that's actually not accurate, but it feels almost to a degree like you want to become the Shopify of your space, meaning that you are democratizing access to this technology and this level of service for an industry that as you rightly point out, taking on some of these other technology platforms is very expensive. Miracle, Miracle's expensive. Marketplace is expensive, relatively speaking here. These are expensive technologies. And because they are expensive technologies, yes, they do lots of stuff and they do lots of stuff well, but I wouldn't call it democratic in the sense that really only mid-enterprise brands and larger can access these technologies and make use of these technologies Whereas it feels like you are trying to make your technology much more broadly acceptable and or accessible. And as a result of that, what you lose in maybe per customer profitability, you make up for in volume. So you're taking more mm-hmm. of the Shopify model, which says, okay, Shopify has three or four different plans from, all the way from about 29 bucks a month, I think is their cheapest plan. There's almost no merchant in the world that can't afford 29 bucks a month to get up and running on Shopify. And so it's definitely Shopify and big commerce and some of the other SaaS platforms have really democratized access to e-commerce for D2C brands because they are so inexpensive to get into initially. And it feels Mm -hmm. like you're trying to bring that same concept to your technology. All I can say is yes. Yeah, I mean, we've had that in in pitch decks before, right? this idea of the Shopify of, of resale. I, I love how you said it, dem- democratizing resale for all brands and creating something that is accessible for all brands to be able to integrate 
and build into their business models from the beginning before they're a hundred million dollar brand. And are you finding that across your stable of partners, is there, is it emerging that there's a trend, i.e., okay, 80% of our brands want to do facilitate peer to peer selling? or they want to do take back, or is there a trend emerging that, or maybe it's a stepped process. Maybe they start out with peer to peer because it's so lightweight. It's easy to lift and shift into the business. And then maybe once they dip their toes in those waters, then they maybe integrate an element of take back. Is there a roadmap that you're seeing develop as a common pathway to get into this space through most of your partners? I think peer to peer will always be the easiest for brands to implement that is extremely low lift that's that customers understand we only launched our first ever take back program with ten tree about two or three months ago and so the idea of take back at least on treat is relatively new and so in that way peer to, it, things are definitely skewed more towards peer to peer but all of our brands will be able to do both or one or the other <laughs> and the other piece that we built out is what we call brand direct which allows brands to sell a lot of their unsold inventory, their returns, damage inventory production units, all this other stuff through tree very easily as well. And so it's a cop-out answer because it remains to be seen where exactly brands will gravitate to. My hunch is that the smaller brands will stick with peer-to-peer and the ones that have higher price points that that have a larger audience that they can reach can get to really like bigger customer base that they can tell about this program and get items back those ones might be more attracted to a a a take back sort of program and be able to justify the cost because there are more costs associated with a take back program there's just more people touching it but it can also provide a lot of great brand control for the brand to take in the inventory or with one of our partners and provide a really great customer experience on top of that since Peer to peer can often take five, six, seven days before a customer ships out an item. And so there's definitely pros and cons to each model. And how much of this do you think is being driven by a desire to do better, be better, look better, the social impact, the ability to talk about the social conscience versus these brands looking at the available resale market for their goods? And seeing there down here in New Zealand, we've got trade me and there's marketplaces all over the world from Etsy to everything that people are already finding ways to resell goods in some way, shape or form on other marketplaces or other channels, even Facebook market, et cetera. And how yeah. much of this is being driven by the commercial proposition or the commercial benefit to these brands of tapping into that market and being able to clip the ticket in some way across those that, that entire resale upsell market versus just trying to do something good. Obviously, it's hard for you to be able to gauge what their motives are, but I'm guessing that there is a commercial incentive in some respects to try to keep these brands in-house as much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. What I can say is the first brands that we launched, maybe the first 20, 25 or so, maybe 90% of them were brands that had some sort of sustainable ethical ethos and so it was one more reason to launch the program beyond the revenue opportunity or customer loyalty or things like that. So it, it matched and expanded their own vision for the company and their own mission. And those companies would care less about the revenue opportunity because they were doing something that was right for their brand and that matched what their customers were expecting them to do. The next wave of brands that we see adopting resale, a lot of them are doing it because they think it's a great business move. So w- with a traditional resale retail model, it's linear, right? You only get to create value when the item sold the first time. With resale, you get to create value several times. And when those customers resell their items on your resale site, not only do you get revenue from that sale, but most of the time the sellers are choosing credit back to your brand and then spending two to three times their credit back on your main site when they're shopping for a new item. And so that's starting to really add up and more and more brands are coming to us and saying, hey, we have this resale market that is is in the hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars a year annually from a GMB standpoint. How do we get a piece of this? How do we control this? And as resale is growing like 11 times faster than retail, it's going to be the way that a huge percentage of shoppers, especially younger shoppers that aren't going to be so young in the near future, are going to prefer to shop. And so brands, it's it now is the time for brands to really consider what their resale strategy is and to get it in place before it gets too big elsewhere for them where it's going to be hard to rein it back in. And I guess this also taps into a market that perhaps in the older generations would have all been 
focused through op shops, the Salvation Army, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, where we had these very traditional channels, local clothing bins, et cetera, where we had these very accepted channels of effectively reselling or giving away and then reselling. You had these middle people or these middle businesses that were in the middle being the op shops that were vetting products, making sure they were clean, putting them on the shelves and profiting off the resale aspect of those or, or reselling them as costumes for events or whatever the case may be. Mm. Really what you're doing is it's almost like bringing a digital facilitation bent to this entire model of the op shop. You're effectively saying, okay, brands, you can establish your own online op shop and cut out the middleman. You become the middleman again on your own products, and which is exactly what you should be if you want to own the brand experience for all the way to the end of life of your product. It, it, exactly. And we wouldn't be anywhere without those original thrift stores, secondhand stores, many of which we still, I still shop out. There's a thrift, amazing thrift store right down the street from us in San Francisco that we do a lot of our shopping out when I'm not shopping on treat. And the revel, like the evolution of resale has all spawned from that. And so it was the original Goodwills, thrift stores, secondhand shops, et cetera, that then spawned the like eBay, I guess, was the OG reseller. And then from there, you had a lot of specialists that were doing apparel. So Poshmark and ThreadUp came out of that. And then a lot more specialty from Grailed, focusing on uh, on menswear to StockX and and sites like Rebag, focusing on, on bags. And then the next generation of companies are basically like the treats of the world. And we wouldn't exist without everyone already going before us because we can point to these trends and show the brands that, look, there's this giant community of people that are buying and selling secondhand. And it's going to be, able, you're going to be able to be more sustainable, reduce your carbon footprint. ThreadUp came out with a study that basically showed that buying a used item displaces the need for creating a new one, thereby reducing its footprint by about 82%, this carbon footprint. And so you suddenly have this thing where you say, hey, there's this massive trend. And again, we are on the shoulders or the backs of giants of the posh marks of the world and things like that. And you can be a more sustainable business. And so it really becomes a win-win for everybody involved. And are you thinking about, and I'm sure you may not be commercially in a position to be able to talk about this, but have you considered, or is it on your roadmap or part of the grand scheme to effectively create a marketplace of marketplaces, meaning that you would create an umbrella treat marketplace where if a brand so chose, they could list the, those items on their own marketplace, but also dual list those items on a master treat marketplace at the same time to where effectively you are, again, behaving more like a brand aggregator on a master mm -hmm. website like an Amazon, like an eBay, whatever, that you would be able to effectively be a almost an acquisition channel in some respects, mm -hmm. these brands in your own right adding to their ability to resell to their existing customer base. Jason, you should be on our product team. It, it's The answer is actually yes to a degree. We actually did launch something called treat.shop, T-R-E-T dot shop, you can spell shop, which is an aggregated, basically a glorified directory across our brands where customers that are already shopping from Treat can go and buy and sell our brands and shop across brands and things like that. I don't think we'll ever get to the point where we're a like a pot, uh, a posh mark, if you will, but there's been a lot of great companies like Treat that are e we call it an e-com enabler that have leveraged the power of their customers into a more aggregate shop or marketplace. Companies like Afterpay have we've seen do this really well. Companies like Route are doing this, and uh, and already doing this to a degree. And it may be something that we do decide to invest more in eventually. But today, our core focus is more on the Shopify of resale platform concepts and really helping brands hone this in and doing it effectively and providing the tools for them to do it really great in a great way and to understand the value of their resale market and for their customers to find the right home for their items. Love it. Absolutely love it. Now, how do you guys make your money? Your SaaS platform, obviously, your turnkey into end SaaS platform for brands. Do you charge mm -hmm. a fixed fee for the platform, for the hosting? Do you charge a transactional fee for every transaction you facilitate? How do you guys make your money? Yeah, it's a combination of, of the above. Really, it's a small SaaS fee. We call it like our keep the lights on fee, just enough to pay server costs. And then we have a transaction fee. We take about 10% from transactions typically. And then, but in, in that way, our incentives are really aligned with brands and really make most of our money when brands are making money. And so we're building the tools to help them generate as much GMV as they can through the platform. 
and create as many listings as possible and bring their customers in and make that conversion rate as high as possible. And so in that way, I would say nearly all of, or all of, I have to look at the most recent day, data of our brands are actually doing resale profit, which means very <laughs> elementary, but they're not paying more for resale than they're actually making. And so they're able to actually, it's a big deal. They're able to do resale in a profitable way from their first week of sales. Yeah, because I would assume that this almost to a degree is a lost leader, but it's brand builder. So the fact that you have data that shows that they are doing this profitably in, in most cases, if not all cases, is quite a resounding, I guess it's a resounding validation of the business model and of your platform affordability for these brands as well. Exactly. And that kind of brings our conversation full circle to the beginning, which is like, how can we make this actually profitable for brands where they're not going to launch and then have such high costs that it's not going to work and then opt out. We really have a 0% churn rate. There's been a couple brands that have launched some short pilots with us, but no brand that is actually just completely opted out of Treat. And I think that also says a lot about the value that Treat's offering them. Wow, that is absolutely incredible, mate. Now, if people want to learn more about Treat and or get in touch with you, are they best to just go to the website Treat? And, and again, it's trt.co. Are they best to go to the website, request a demo through there, or are they best to reach out to you on LinkedIn? Jake, does, how would you prefer that people get a hold of you? Yeah, either works, honestly. Treat.co, people get tripped up that it's a .co and not a com. And also the double E's, T-R-E-T. They can go there and just click request demo, which goes to our sales team, or they can even reach out to me personally. My email, as you can probably guess, is just jake at treat.co. And happy to be a liaison to help you get connected with either myself for a call or our team. And we can go from there. Absolutely amazing. Now we're at the point of our conversation together where I get to flip the script and I get to turn the microphone over to you for one question, any question for me. Microphone over to you, Jake Disraeli from Treat. What is your question for me today? Jason, so I know that you're in you're in Auckland, New Zealand, have lived there for a while. My my question is what what is one character trait? that you've picked up on being in New Zealand that you think we should we should start adopting here in the US or that we could use a little bit more of just in in our culture and it could just be within lifestyle in general or it could be within business culture within startups etc yeah look i that's a such a good question i absolutely love that question and one of the things that i particularly like about Kiwis is the understated nature about how they go about their business, not just business, but in their personal life as well. There's no sort of, there's not a lot of blowing your own horn. There's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of fanfare. There's not a lot of putting things up in light. Uh, there's not too much self-promotion. It's probably almost too far the other direction. It's very just head down, bum up, get things done. You see a problem, tack it. You try to create mm. things. You try to put good things into the world and you're pretty understated about it. And I think that there's something to be said for that sort of that grit, that toughness, that it's a pretty remote nation down here in the bottom of the world. The Kiwis is a, are pretty pioneering in nature. That whole number eight wire mentality is a common reference to Kiwis getting things done with number eight wire. And it's largely a farming nation originally is really what it was known for. But I think that there's something to be said for quiet determination. There's something to be said for quiet grit and just achieving and letting your work speak for itself. I think there's definitely something to be said for that. There's an element of humility and patience that goes along with that, that I think are super admirable traits. Yeah. Of that, hear you. And hearing you say that, I, I do agree. I think that's it. That's quite opposite in terms of the, our culture here about showing everything you're doing, especially when you think about LinkedIn culture, even. And I'm definitely a victim of this as well as you're showing your best self all the time and self-promotion and putting your polished self forward and being more humble is definitely something I think we, we could all learn from. So appreciate that, Jason. Absolutely, mate. I, I Like you, I'm caught in the same trap because at the end of the day, it's difficult, particularly to build an online brand. It's difficult to build an online technology. It's difficult to build a personal brand without, you've got to be your own first best advocate. So tr trying to Absolutely. Stri strike that balance between self-promotion and humility, it's a fine line to walk. It's just difficult. Totally. 
Exactly. I think that uh, you sometimes see this in celebrities or celebrity CEOs that once they've made it, they're able to calm down and, and believe that, that they have faith in the fact that they've made it and they don't need to self-promote as much or they can be them their full selves online without having to just like continually promote. And I do admire that. And But I also question, would they have gotten there without the other stuff too? And it's just a, it's just a good question to, to kind of sit with. I love it. I love it. Listen, mate, I love what you guys are doing. Anything that can be brought to bear on an industry that does have its own set of challenges to face, as all industries do, I think is a good thing. And particularly when it comes to the sustainable nature of what you are encouraging and facilitating, I think that is amazing. I think you've got something tremendously you know, great to be proud of what you're building there with your team. And like I said, you're getting a lot of positive press. And I just hope you guys continue to grow. And I hope you continue to bring your technology to more and more brands over time. And I'd love to have you back on the pod in the future to see what's what's coming for Treat next. If you had one thing, if there was one thing that you'd love to bring to Treat over the next 12 to 24 months, maybe functionality wise or something else, what would it be? We have a lot of really exciting features that, that we're building. And part of the joy of running your own company is if you can dream it, you can build it. It's not always the case. It actually has to be a, a feature that hopefully also relates to your OKRs and can provide growth for your company. But that's been so joyous thinking about new features and really pushing the envelope of what we're doing at Treat. I honestly think it's just anything that we can make it so easy for anyone to both list an item and sell an item uh, and buy secondhand. And at the end of the day, like we want to make secondhand selling as easy as throwing the item in the trash, right? How can we make the incentives so great and the process so seamless and easy that it's never a second thought that you should try to resell your item or send it back to the brand? And that's really what we're obsessively focused on solving. Incredible, Jake. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I'll be watching with great interest how Treat develops over the next 12 to 18 months. And I'd love to get you back on at some stage to give us an update. Yeah. Sounds great, Jason. Thanks so much for having me on. Are you a merchant or software vendor that is focused on e-commerce or omni-channel? Then head over to greenwoodconsulting.net to see how we can help you scale your business.